Good Friday morning, everybody. Hey, I hope everybody's doing good. Took a day off yesterday because I had funerals. And still fully involved in ministry, whether it's hospitals, prayers, uh, weddings, and funerals. Still doing a lot of those things. So, been busy, been tired. Hope everybody's doing good. Hope you're ready for the weekend. I know I am. Um, so, we're going to be doing our 31st. Bible study in the book of Mark. This is uh, number 31. We'll be in Mark chapter 9. Uh, we're going to go from 2. And we're just going to read down through the end of the, uh, to the healing of the, uh, through 13. 2 to 13. My chair is sinking. Look at this. My chair is sinking. I don't know what's going on here today. There we go. But anyway, we'll get it figured out. All right. <clears throat> so we're in Mark chapter 9. This is study 31. And this is verse 2. Um, Jesus is teaching the disciples, of course, about the gospel. This is what he said to them before. Uh, I don't want you speaking in my name just yet. I don't want you preaching just yet. Um, don't say anything. Why? Because he hasn't fully taught them the message that they need. And then they'll get that after Pentecost. They'll be fully empowered by the Holy Spirit to do God's work and to preach the gospel. And we should pray for that as well. Like my buddy Ray this morning, he texted me. He's on his way to Texas to speak in some prisons down in Texas. Ray, good luck. Pray for Ray Sidnor while he preaches. That's a powerful ministry he's got going on. And so he's headed to Texas, and we just pray for this anointing over him, that the Holy Spirit will be with him. Give him words to say that hit people directly. Uh, you know, in prison, guys praying for whatever their needs might be in prison, but uh, that God would give words to give specific words to Ray to reach those people that really need the gospel. So, <clears throat> or just a message of hope being incarcerated is no fun for sure. And so, uh, you know, keep praying for him and, um, uh, let's get into Mark chapter nine after six days, which is interesting, by the way, there's a parallel to this in Exodus. Uh, so if you have your Bible, you're in Mark chapter nine, verse two, We'll be looking at Exodus 23, 24, and 25. There's three verses in each of those chapters that parallel this uh, scripture here teaching from in Mark. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. There's this inner circle. There's this three. So I said, if you're a person of uh, influence or over a company and you have a lot of people pulling for your time, have three people that you give time to. Oh, obviously, God, your family, but then have three good, solid friends or trustees that you work with. That's what Jesus did, and this is the model I use when I counsel business owners and, and company uh, leaders. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led him up to a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elisha, Moses, uh, who were talking with Jesus. And so just uh, number one, remember, we just talked about Jesus saying uh, in, in this is uh, 9-1. I tell you the truth, some are standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Now here we have Peter, James, and John with Jesus on a mountain as he's transfigured. It's quite possible, and it's arguable, of course, that arguable that um, this is that moment when Peter, James, and John see the kingdom. They see Jesus Christ in his, uh, in his glory with Moses and Elijah. And it's interesting that they know who, the, they, who those guys are. And remember that God is the God of the living. There is no death when it literally, for anyone, let me, let me be clear, we're going to lay our body down. But the moment we lay our body down, we are transformed into a spiritual body. We'll stand before God in Hebrews 9, I believe it's 9, 27. We'll stand before God for judgment, whether for rewards or loss of rewards or for this judgment of the second death, which is in Revelation 20. But there is no real death, just a transformation from this body to a new spiritual body. And so we see Moses and Elijah standing with Jesus Christ. These guys are supposed to be dead, but they're not. They're alive. Uh, and they're talking with Jesus. And so Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. He's nervous. He doesn't know what to say. And here goes Peter again. He's always jumping in and uh, maybe not controlling himself the way he should or whatever, for lack of a better word. But Peter's always the one that opens his mouth. 
then that's fine. Just, just say, and Peter said to Jesus, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters for you. One for Moses, one for Elijah. So there'll be three shelters. Now, <clears throat> I want to stop there just for a minute because when we look at um, these things, if we go to, let's go to Ex Exodus 23. I think this is why Peter said this is a Rob thing. This, there's no, um, you know, this is just a Rob thing. This things that I found parallel as I was studying. If you look at Exodus um, 25, actually, Exodus 25, verse 8, it says, Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly in the pattern I will show you. So Peter may be just thinking of Exodus and going, let's make some shelters. If they're going to stay, we need a place for them to stay. And this is what, this is directly from Exodus 25, 8. And you'll also see another verse parallel to Exodus 25, uh, excuse me, 24, 15 to 18. And then in Exodus 23, 21. These three verses from these three chapters actually speak into this portion of Scripture. In my opinion, you may not agree with me, but I, I believe it's very true. For first of all, in verse uh, in chapter 9 and verse 2, it says, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him to the mountain. And when you look at Exodus 25, 15, it says, Moses went up on the mountain, a cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Sinai. And for six days, the cloud covered the mountain. Uh, and on the seventh day, the Lord called Moses <clears throat> from within the cloud, and Moses entered the cloud. Now, that's what you're going to see coming here very quickly is uh, Exodus 24, 15. Number one, it's six days. And then uh, Peter says it's good for us to be here according to Exodus 25. And then uh, and then we'll keep going. So then a cloud appeared, verse seven. And then this is parallel in my opinion, uh, Exodus 24, 15. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them. And who's in there? Moses, which he's been in the cloud before. And a neat verse about that is if you're going through a rough time, if you're in a valley of decision, I don't know, right now, marriages are getting hit so hard. I get so many calls for marriages, basically. And um, uh, if, you're, if you're in a dark spot, is what I'm trying to say, that know that God dwells in your thick darkness. You are in this cloud, you're in this funk in your life, but you're not alone. And that's what's neat, is that from within the cloud, the voice spoke. Sometimes we get to these dark places and we just got to get a word from God to get back on our feet to get out of these dark places, but know for sure that God dwells in your thick darkness and he's by your side throughout this. Here we are, we're enveloped in a cloud on this mountain with Peter, James, and John, and Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. These are the people that are here, so it's very specific. So Peter, James, John, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. you got six people on this mountain, and a voice from the cloud comes out. This is God speaking, just like Exodus 24. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him and that's Exodus 23 21 so 23 Exodus 23 24 and 25 kind of coincide with this portion of scripture so um, this is my son so now we have we could say Jesus Christ and if you were going to speak of the Trinity that the cloud could represent the spirit and then you have the voice from heaven uh, when God is speaking so you have Jesus the spirit and God speaking all present at one time of course, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but we do have evidence that there is a Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see it also with the baptism of Jesus Christ. You have Jesus being baptized. You have the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, and you have a voice from heaven. There's also one in John chapter 12. So three times you see the Trinity together while Christ is on earth at the baptism, at the transfiguration, and in John chapter 12 when the voice comes out and says, this is my son. So there's three times. And so here's, this is, we're in one of those times. This is my son. Listen to him in accordance with Exodus 23, 21. And then suddenly they looked around and no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. So these men appeared. They had a conference, perhaps. We don't know what they talked about. Uh, maybe discussing him going to the cross. Maybe he needed some support as a human, obviously fully God, fully man. Maybe he needed some encouragement as he nears the, the time of the cross. We don't know. But they looked around and, and everybody was gone. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they saw. Why? Because they didn't understand it. If they brought this up, they were just going to confuse people and, and, and uh, damage their credibility for sure. 
And Jesus didn't want that because they couldn't give them a depth, an in-depth answer. So he gave him orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. That would be after the resurrection. In Acts chapter 1, he gives them one of the great commissions, go preach the gospel in Judea, Jerusalem, and the uttermost parts of the world. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And then the Holy Spirit is delivered in Acts chapter 2. And then Peter speaks very boldly from that point on after being empowered by the Holy Spirit. So he's like, hang on, wait until I'm risen, wait until the Holy Spirit's delivered, wait till you really understand the full gospel, which isn't complete until the resurrection, and then go preach. So they kept the matter unto themselves, discussing what raising from the dead meant. Now that's something that would be confusing. What does that mean? Does he really literally mean raising from the dead? You know how people would be today. All figurative, figurative, definitely figurative. There's no way this stuff could really happen. But he really is going to defeat death and rise from the dead. And they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Now here's another reference to the Old Testament. You can't have, by the way, one testament without the other. The Old Testament pushes and points to the coming of Christ. And all the fulfillment of the prophecies in the Old Testament are in the New Testament. So they're asking this question because we know in Malachi, if we look, so we know like Deuteronomy um, 18.15 is one of the verses, before the Messiah comes, a pro uh, or I will send, excuse me, a prophet in my name in the last days. And that prophet was uh, Jesus Christ, or he was the Messiah. Uh, and so that's why they're asking. They know in Deuteronomy 18, 15, it says that. But specifically, if you look at Malachi, the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1, it says, See, I will send my messenger who will prepare my way before me. And then in Malachi 4, verse 5, See, I will send to you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of their fathers to their children, the hearts of the children of their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. And so you see these prophecies in Deuteronomy 18, Malachi 3, and Malachi 4 talking about this Elijah that was to come. Now this Elijah, you'll see Jesus explains who that is. And so they said, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? And because it's in the Old Testament. So Jesus replied in, chapter, in verse 12, to be sure Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then it is written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come. Who is he speaking of? He's speaking of John the Baptist. And that's actually in Matthew eleven fourteen, is when Jesus says this specifically. Matthew eleven fourteen. If you want to know where he is uh, talks about this, is John the Baptist inquires of him, is he the Messiah or should we wait for another? And this is quoted in, in Matthew 11. I will send my messenger ahead of you. This is Malachi. And then in, in Matthew eleven, fourteen, 14, it says, If you are willing to accept it, John the Baptist is the Elijah who was to come. So they know that this prophecy was spoken in Malachi. It was fulfilled in John the Baptist. And John the Baptist paved the way for Jesus Christ. And so he's transfigured in this portion of Scripture. He is validating who uh, John the Baptist was, the Elijah who was to come. Uh, and then we'll just keep reading here. Matthew, or excuse me, Mark 8, Mark 9, 12. Jesus replied to be sure Elijah does come first and restores all things. So he is setting into order all things to point to Christ. Now, when John the Baptist was asked if he was the Messiah, he denied it. Why? Because he didn't want that fame. He didn't want that title. We know that. In John 3.30, John the Baptist preached, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. And so that's why he doesn't want this title. But Jesus says for sure that he was the Elijah that was to come. So why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? Again, he's talking about the cross. They don't understand that message yet, but he's going to show that it's going to be fulfilled. But I tell you, Elijah has come. And they have done to him everything they wish. What they do to him, they arrested him in Mark chapter 2. And they beheaded him, or Herod had him beheaded um, when Herodias danced for him. So they did everything they wanted. They grabbed John the Baptist. They abused him. They put him in prison. And then they beheaded him. And so Jesus is just stating, I tell you, Elijah has come. And they have done to him everything they wish, just as it was written about him. So what is he really saying? 
Obviously, he's authenticating who John the Baptist was, but he's also saying that, yes, you are correct. Elijah was to come first, and when he did, that left the door open for me to come after he paved the way for me. So he's validating John the Baptist. He's fulfilling this scripture that was spoken in Deuteronomy 18, 15, Malachi 3, 1, and Malachi 4. And so this is about him. He's saying, yes, Elijah came, and therefore you should know that after Elijah comes the Messiah, and that's who I am. So anyway, that's uh, Mark chapter 9, the transfiguration. Uh, we see the Trinity together. We see the kingdom of heaven. We get a, just a peek into the kingdom of heaven. And we get the validation of the fulfillment of the prophecies in Malachi 3, 4, and Deuteronomy 18, 15. So that's it for today. That's uh, lesson 31. I hope everybody's doing good. Hope we everybody's surviving the hurricane. And um, we'll see everybody tomorrow. Or no, see you Monday morning.